Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and we love to help the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes. This year, my team and I flew to London for the 2019 World Championship of Shoemaking, where I again served as a judge. Over 40 shoemakers from around the world submitted shoes, and the caliber and craftsmanship of the shoes submitted this year was incredibly impressive, pushing the bar even higher than last year. Here we are at the 2019 World Championship of Shoemaking, and this is where all the judging is going to take place. So this is the first look at all of the samples that we have that we're going to be taking a look for 2019. Now, as you can see, the call for entry is totally different this year. Instead of a black cap to Oxford, we have a full wingtip, which is the polar opposite of what we looked at last year. What's exciting about this year is we're going to see a lot more creative interpretations uh, of what a full wingtip should look like. Uh, there were less specifications about exactly how the shoe had to look uh, and as you can see some absolutely incredible examples here of uh, some of the highest quality bespoke craftsmanship coming out of the world. So there's three different criteria that we're evaluating all the shoes on. It's a 25 point scale. The first one is difficulty. So how difficult is the technical execution? Uh, were the uppers hand sewn? Uh, what was the stitch density of the outsoles? You know just looking from a pure technical perspective how these shoes are actually being built. Then second is execution. So uh, the first one is technique. The second one is how well was that done? So how even is the stitching? How uh, proportionate are all the patterns? How well is the outsole done? Uh, looking at the heel, how was that executed? And then the last one, which is probably the most subjective, is design. So looking at this as an interpretation of a wingtip, how are the proportions built? How aesthetically pleasing is the shoe? All that's being totaled to five, and then all the judges are going to take all their points. We're going to add them all up, and that's who, what's going to determine uh, who the first, second, and third place winners are. So this is a very interesting shoe, as you can see. You know, one of the interesting things about the World Championship of Shoemaking is that, you know, shoemakers are always making shoes for other people, but this is an opportunity for them to make shoes for themselves and have a little bit of fun with it. As you can see, this one with its kind of clown uh, shaped elastic. Clearly, the shoemaker uh, is having some fun with this particular shoe. Now, the execution of this shoe and the way that it's made still at a very high level, uh, even though you would look at this and say, uh, this isn't something I would ever wear. So it's an opportunity for, uh, you know, shoemakers to really show their creativity uh, and how they interpret a particular style uh, and just have fun with it. The following day on Saturday, March 23rd, shoegazing blog and Jay Fitzpatrick organized the London Super Trunk Show at showcase.co located on Regent Street, where various shoemakers came together to showcase their works. It was at this event that the World Championship of Shoemaking, World Championship of Patina, and World Championship of Shoe Shining took place. This is the second World Championship in uh, Shoemaking that we host together with uh, Kirby Allison's Hanger Project. What was uh, done is that uh, Previous this fall, we had a, a call for competition where we announced what the World Championship would be this year. And this time, it was a dark brown, full brogue Oxford, a wingtip. Uh, it had to have a single leather sole, had to be hand welted with handmade sole stitch, and uh, had to be four to six, six leather pieces and some other uh, criteria. Uh, and what we did was to look at uh, the difficulty of the making, how uh, hard the parts have been, how uh, complicated stuff they had made. We also looked at execution, which was how good they were made, how well executed the making was and uh, uh, those things. So those two categories received 10 points each maximum. And then we also looked at the design, the overall beauty of the shoe, looking at it as uh, objective as possible, and the balance of the pattern and the last and all that, which received five points as maximum. So from all the jury members, they could receive maximum 25 points, okay? Uh, so yesterday we had a session. The shoes have been reviewed anonymously. So I have known who had entered because I took care of the registrations, but I didn't know which shoe was which, was which, and all the other ones, they only were presented with the number. 
uh, and then we graded uh, the shoes. So, what I have in front of me now, it's the top 10 in the World Championships in Shoemaking 2019. And uh, what was quite interesting was that when I summarized all the points yesterday in this Excel file, I think it was between number 10 and number 3, it was 15 points or something like that. And in total it's uh, between 180 and 250 points or something like that uh, for the, the overall ones. But uh, top 10 to 3 was super tight. Uh, so <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. None ended up on the same position, like I think it was yes, last year, but uh, this year um, it was super tight in the top. And also the ones outside top 10 was very close. Uh, I should say that what the winner gets is 3,000 pounds. He gets this glass plaquette. He gets to have the shoe travel around the world uh, to be displayed in these around 10 locations. For the third, they also go on the, at second, also go on the tour, receive 2,000 pounds. Third, uh, 1,000 pounds. So there's quite a few bit of money in this. Number 10 in uh, this year's World Championship was Ras Maftey. And I think he's here somewhere, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So congrats, really good job. Um, all right, number nine is Per Nobile from uh, Russia. Yeah, here we are. I have to say that Maffei is from uh, Austria. Number eight is uh, Anthony Delos. Here we have that from France. Number six, number seven, uh, with the number six <laughs> uh, on the entry shoe, uh, it's uh, so Tsuchiya from Japan. Pretty interesting shoe for sure. Now number six, it's uh, Louise Lamperdorfer from uh, Germany that uh, works uh, here in England. He's also in the uh, in the room. All right, now top five. Uh, starting to get interesting, <laughs> for sure. I should go through them. We have uh, Atelier Sakaria uh, from Russia. We have Victor Vulpe, who's here somewhere. Uh, Victor, yeah. Actually, you can come up here. Yeah, come up. Um, from Romania, Victor Vulpe. We have uh, Christoph Kote from uh, France. We have Daniel Vegan from uh, England, but from Sweden from the beginning. And we have uh, Eji Murata as well, from Japan. I don't know why I pushed the shoes forward. That made it weird. <laughs> yeah, Daniel Vegan. All right, don't look at this. <laughs> Number five was Atelier Sakaryan from Russia. Number four, Victor Vulpe from Romania. Really an amazing shoe here, yeah. Here you can see with the toe taps, very tight stitching and all, yeah. Really amazing. So, Top three left. Um, so, winning a thousand pounds and uh, traveling around the world uh, with this shoe and also get to exhibit at Isetan uh, is uh, Eji Murata from Japan. <laughs> All right. Now the man behind me either wins or comes in second. <laughs> wins or loses, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
So what I will do is to present the winner. I think I've learned that from, you know, the sh TV shows and all that. So we have Christophe Cote from France. We have uh, Daniel Vigan, living in, in England, from Sweden. Lovely country in the north. You should go there. Okay. The world champion in shoemaking 2019 is Daniel Vigan. Amazing job. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is the masterpiece. Uh, I'm just going to exchange a quick word with Victor first. Uh, really nice shoe that you've done here. How, how uh, you have a lot of diamond broguing and all that. Was it difficult to decide uh, what you wanted to do? Uh, I, I think about uh, this shoe for a month. I mean, just drawing and thinking, and actually working is one and a half, one and a half months. So it's not an easy task for any shoemaker to make just one shoe in one and a half months. <laughs> yeah, really good job. Congratulations to the fourth place. Okay, and then uh, the winning shoe. Uh, it's. Almost a shoe, some would uh, debate it, but as uh, you know from the, uh, from the conditions for the, the, that we set, uh, set out for the competition, it doesn't have to be wearable. It's supposed to be a size 42 in length, that's the only size we specify. So it can be made uh, like this, or uh, like this, or like a normal shoe. We don't uh, look at that. Tell me a little bit about this. I know you spend a lot of time. You came, Daniel came runner-up uh, last year, second place. Uh, and this year you spend even more efforts. Tell me a bit about the shoe. Yeah, I think last year I just did what I normally do, maybe with a few changes. But this was something that's very different from what I usually do and things I've never done before. And something I thought would be in the spirit of the competition. Uh, and something that would be a little bit more interesting and exciting to look at. And um, yeah, it took a lot longer to do than what it did last year. This, uh, this time you made it all by yourself, and as I understand it, you hand stitched and uh, made everything by hand. Yeah, the upper is hand sewn, which maybe some people didn't recognize because it's probably smaller than most sewing machines. And uh, I've always had a fascination for hand sewn uppers of. Uh, a long, long time ago, and this is my kind of tribute to that. And I like hand sewn things, and I wanted to do last year. I had the help of an upper maker, and I wanted this to be be all mine. And uh, no machine or electricity was involved, other than the lighting in the workshop. Um, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Maybe candle light next year. <laughs> <laughs> but you did the the gimping as well. Punch by hand. Yeah, the gimping, is by, the gimping is by hand, the sewing is by hand. Uh, and what's uh, that's for the shoe nuts, that's always interesting with uh, the density of the stitching, can you say? Yeah, the upper is done 21 stitches per inch because it's the smallest marking wheel I could find. And the sole is 25 to the inch because I did 21 last year. So you gotta do better next year. Yeah. 30 next year then. Ah, easy, easy. <laughs> Okay, what was the hardest part with the shoe? Making the upper by hand. At least time consuming. And if you make a mistake, it's so obvious. Because it's right there. Uh, a lot of making, bottom making is done on the inside. You have a bit more margin for error. And the heel was very complicated to make it strong enough and not crack and not feel like something that's going to break when you look at it. Yeah. It's not super durable, but it doesn't feel fragile. It feels like it could almost be a shoe. <laughs> Congratulations, Daniel. Really nice. Yeah, uh, welcome forward to take photos and uh, have a look at these amazing shoes. Stay for some more drinks. Go look at all the amazing exhibitors here. 
and uh, see you again next year. We continue until 7, okay. Thank you, everyone. We just found out that Daniel Wiegand of Gatiano and Girling is the 2019 champion. I couldn't tell you, uh, you know, just how happy I am for you, Dan. Uh, congratulations. I mean, how does it feel? I mean, the relief has to be just... Yeah, usually I'm not too bad, but the last hour is a bit nervous. It's more, more curiosity yes. than fear. <laughs> well, the countdown was incredibly suspenseful, and yeah, I couldn't yeah. imagine, you know, the, uh, what it was going through your veins those last few seconds before you announced. I mean, such an incredible shoe, but what we've seen this year is really all of the top ten are incredible shoes. Yeah, you know, all of the things that are on the table here are all amazing, really great shoes, and I think that everyone that made this could have done the other shoe. Yeah. It's not a matter of necessarily skill, but imagination and, you know, you never know what's going to appeal to the judges, but it just feels good that my best work is good enough to, to please the judges this year. So, Well, so. here we are, 2019 world champion. Do you think you'll do it again next year? Yeah, probably. <laughs> you can't get it out of you, can you? No, it'd be fun to judge, but, I'd, you know, it depends on maybe what the kind of shoe we need to make next year is. If I feel like it's something I could do a good job of, I'd probably like to enter. Yeah. If I don't think it's my cup of tea, I'd probably be a judge. So. Well, congratulations again, Daniel. And, uh, you know, we look forward to celebrating with you tonight. So Thank you. I, yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> Enjoy the moment. Yeah. So I'm here with Jim McCormick, one of uh, the most renowned and well-respected shoemakers in all of the West End. He was uh, one of the judges uh, here at the 2019 World Championship of Shoemaking. And uh, Jim, thank you so much uh, for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, so Jim is going to just talk us through, as a shoemaker, uh, kind of how he sees this shoe. I mean, it's such an incredible representation of the craft. And uh, you've had a long career as a bespoke shoemaker, first starting out at Lob. You yes. know, in the, what, 1970s? In the 70s. 70s. Yeah. yeah. So talk to us a little bit about, I mean, you know, you really are kind of almost behind the scenes. I mean, most people will never meet you. I mean, you're the person that, you know, receives an upper, receives a last, yeah. and then really does all the yeah. closing. So pulling, you know, the upper over the last, building the bottoms, doing the insoles, welting yes. it, yeah. closing it. Yeah. I mean, you are really the one that does everything except making the last and then sewing the upper two together, which you can do also. I do that, but yeah, yeah my main job is, is, is the main So where have you been? I mean, just someone that's not familiar. I mean, you started with Lobs. You've really worked for everyone. I started with Lob and then went to work at Foster's with uh, Terry Moore. One of the most yeah. well-regarded, yeah. uh, you know, last makers of really I've, the I've worked for history. Cleverly. I've worked for g, &G. Uh, I've pretty much worked for all the... Did you work for, you know, George Cleverly? And was uh, he alive or? No, he wasn't actually. He okay. wasn't. Um, and I only worked for Cleverly for a brief period. Okay. But, um, yeah, so I pretty much, you know, uh, I know I know the West End very well. Yeah. And um, this shoe actually is, is quite a departure from that. Um, and that's probably what makes it so special mm -hmm. because it's just, it's, it's really like a, a throwback to the exhibition shoes of maybe the 1840s and 50s. I mean, this reminds me whenever I walk into John Lobb St. James, they've got, you know, those old That's cabinets right. yeah. of the shoes that really yeah. made them famous because John Lobb really came to fame, yes. you know, by winning all these international competitions. At the great exhibitions. At the yeah. great exhibitions yeah. that were, you know, yeah. during the late 19th century, early yeah. 20th. Yeah. And this is the type of shoe that you see. That's right, yeah, yeah. And they were always, the exhibition shoes were always very stylized, um, everything exaggerated to, to show off workmanship. And this is what Daniel's done. And he's made a fantastic job of it. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, I, I voted it as a top shoe because the sheer amount of work is just, it's exactly. incredible, yeah. it's incredible. And not just that, I mean, one of the things that I think is really impressive about this shoe is how he's resurrected a lot of these, you know, really fine, incredibly high-level yes. shoemaking yeah. uh, skills that you only would have seen in an exhibition shoe. Yes. But in an exhibition shoe, you know, 150 years ago. Yes. You know, I mean, this type of work hasn't been seen in, in easily decades, if not a century. That's right, yeah. yeah. So whenever you see this, I mean, what are some of the things that immediately jump out at you and you just are in awe of? Well, let's uh, start at the, the beginning. Uh, the last shape is um, pretty amazing. It's, it, it's very um, accentuated uh, to try and show off all these different things like the narrow waist and all that. Um, 
the closing of the upper, which is done by hand, and the, uh, what we call the gimping or the notching on the brogue, done by hand as well. That's normally done by machine. Having, having done it myself, it's incredibly difficult to do, to do it to this, this level. And, and, and the level being, you know, not just by hand, which even on bespoke shoes, I can't think of any West End bespoke shoemaker that does the uppers by hand. They don't. Because it's just so impractical. Yes. Now, before the invention of the sewing machine, this is how a shoe was made. It was. But yeah. not only is it made by hand, but it's made by hand at, you know, what did he say, like a 21 or 22? I think this is 21 SPI, stitches to the inch. Which yeah. is yeah. My, my closing machine at home stitches um, maybe 15, 16. Maximum. Uh, well, you, you can alter, you can get different wheels for it. But, um, so, so this is fine stitching, you know, by, by any standard. And then there's the sole stitching, I think he's done 25 to the inch, which is pretty amazing. And just technically, the whole thing, um, the heel, this, this is what you would really call a jockey heel. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly difficult to yeah. do, incredibly difficult to make. And he, he's just made a really nice job of it. Yeah. He's made the plates himself, which is another, yeah. another skill completely. I just think everything he's done is to a very high level. I mean, even the heel stacking, I mean, yeah. you know, a normal bespoke shoe might have three or four stacks, you know, pieces of leather sandwiched together. Yeah. You know, Dan, Daniel said this has 15. Yeah. And so to and do that without having it collapse and yeah. look sloppy. And the idea is that um, smaller lifts, you get a tighter heel and you get a nicer finish because uh, there's, there's no possibility of it opening up. And all the exhibition boots from the 1850s and that, they've all got very tiny lifts in them. And it just looks fantastic, doesn't it? It sure does. Yeah. Yeah. So I take my hat off to him. He's done a, he's done a really good job. I mean, even the nail, you know, the yeah. pegging, the brass pegging on the yeah. heel, I mean, is, is perfect. Yes. Uh, yeah. And then even looking inside the shoe, I mean, that's another area, yeah. you know, where some of the shoes, you know, they said, you know, make sure you check inside because you'd look on the inside of some of them and they weren't finished. This one is, is impeccably finished on the inside as it is the oh, outside. Oh, it is, yeah. And yeah. then also, I mean, around the top border, you have this interlocking kind of chain stitch. Yes. Which it, it, it's, it's a real work of art, actually, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the stitching involved in this shoe is... And then even if you were to step back and just look at the shoe as a whole, I mean, just the proportions of the pattern on the last are, you know, strike a beautiful elegance to it in an exaggerated, almost haute couture, high fashion way. Yeah, I think when you first look at it, it kind of catches your eye and you're not sure what to make of it. But when you examine it in detail, you see more and more things that are just outstanding, really. And absolutely beautiful. Um, Another element I really enjoy is on the back, how we have, you know, this lip. Yeah, yeah and it follows through, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And to work that into the hard countering, yeah. I imagine yeah. there's another degree of just technical it's just, element. It's just so well thought out, the whole thing, because making it is one thing, but coming up with the, the concept yeah. is, is another thing yeah. entirely. Yeah. And then, you know, with a bespoke shoe, I mean, every single piece of this process has to be executed perfectly because you could yeah. have the most beautifully yeah. hand-closed upper, and then you could be, you know, I don't know, welting it or sewing yeah. the outsole on. And, yeah totally ruin the shoe. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And I, I've known Daniel since his beginning days in shoemaking. And I'm really proud of him. I mean, I, I haven't been involved in teaching him. I've always tried to give him any tips or anything if he wanted them, but he's perfectly capable of, uh, you know, doing it himself. And I, I'm very proud of what he's achieved. He's, yeah. he's really, he's really cracked it, yeah. I think, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So generally, I mean, what do you think sets Dan apart you know, as a bespoke shoemaker, you know, from... He's, he's just so focused. I mean, he lives and breathes shoemaking. And in my younger days, I did to some extent, but not quite to Daniel's yeah. level. And he's just dedicated and he's just absolutely loves it and just wants to keep doing it, you know. Yeah. He, he's driven, he's driven to do it. And he's very good at it. Yeah. So he should, be, he should be very proud of what he's done. Yeah. It's a marvelous shoe and it it's is, a, yeah. you know, I mean, I think it really exemplifies the high end of what can be done with shoes. Yeah. And, uh, I don't think we've seen work like this 
for many a year. Many a year. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So, um, Jim, thank you so much. My You're pleasure. on Instagram. You have a beautiful Instagram account. Thank you. Uh, thank how you. can people find that? Uh, yeah, my, my Instagram account is uh, Jim's underscore shoe workshop. Shoe workshop. And I call it a glimpse into um, a bespoke shoemaker's workshop. And I just try and show the everyday things that we do. I, I don't really, I don't have great photography skills, but I just try and show the insides of the shoe and the kind of work that I do. And, uh, I mean, traditionally, because so much of the shoemaking is done by outworkers, which yes. is just a part of the London trade. I mean, it's nothing specific to shoemaking. You no. see it in tailoring. Yeah. You know, you see it in shirt making, even how ties are made. Yes. You know, they're all sent home to outmen workers. And so because of that, even if you go visit, you know, a bespoke uh, workshop, oftentimes you don't see the closing actually being done. No. And so one of the things I really appreciate about your Instagram account is that it does offer that glimpse of the, into the closing, yes. into the making. Yes, and, and you can see uh, before the sole goes on, you can see the welt stitching. Yes. And that can be a thing of beauty as Absolutely. well. You know. um, and it's just to try and highlight the, the effort that goes into bespoke shoes because people can, can see the shoes and think, wow, that's very expensive. When you see the amount of work that goes into it, yeah. Hopefully, it justifies yeah, absolutely. what it is. Yeah. Better allow someone to appreciate, the, yeah. you know, the price of the shoe. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, you know, thank you so much, Jim, and uh, you know, pleasure. I appreciate everything you do for the industry. I know that you. you know you're so well respected amongst you know all the bespoke shoemakers that I well, that wow. I speak to, I and um, yeah, nice. you know, it's been a pleasure to judge alongside of you, and I look forward to doing it again next year. Sure, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.